Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this week's monsoon seminar. Uh, the talk that today is going to be given by Boris Karatsolis. He did his PhD at the University of Uppsala in Sweden. He's from Greece originally. He has a master's degree uh, in oceanography and marine environmental management, and he did a bachelor's degree in geology at the National and Kapodistrian University of Athens in Greece. And he works generally on paleoclimatology and micropaleontology, particularly in the late Miocene and Pliocene. He's an IODP veteran, worked on the Northwest Europe, uh, Australian shelf, and he's about to go back on the ship this summer in the North Atlantic. So you probably know the rules by now. If you want to ask him a question, please put it into the chat and I'll call on you at the end of the talk. If you could mute yourselves and turn off your cameras, that's great. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Boris to give his presentation. Thank you. You're muted, Boris. Yes, I know. Great. No, I'm not. <laughs> now you're not. That's wonderful. Great. Uh, can you all see my presentation? <laughs> I hope so. Yes. So, <laughs> good. Thank you, Peter. Uh, and thank you for introducing me also. Uh, I'm really happy to be here. And I'm really happy to be part of this uh, monsoon seminar community. Um, I will talk about uh, the end of the late Miocene to Pliocene biogenic bloom today and uh, the possible role of the Asian monsoon. And um, um, the results and the, the data I will be presenting today come from the research I did uh, uh, during my PhD at Uppsala University. And um, I mainly focused during these years at phytoplankton. Uh, this was the main, uh, my, my research focus there and uh, specifically the abundance and the species distribution of uh, key phytoplanktonic species and, and the evolution of these species uh, across interesting intervals of Earth's history. Um, and as you all probably know, phytoplankton is really important and that's why we, we study its, its evolution and abundance in past uh, periods because uh, these are tiny organisms that live in the ocean uh, produce uh, vast amounts of oxygen and they also absorb, absorb carbon dioxide and they also form uh, the basis of life in the ocean and they are they play an integral role in in different cycles such as the nitrogen and carbon cycle in the ocean and uh, all the material that I studied uh, comes from sediment cores from marine sediments and uh, this material is, is great for past climatic uh, reconstructions. And uh, there are specific physical characteristics uh, of the environment that are preserved in the sediment and they are called proxy uh, records. And uh, these proxy records can help us reconstruct a, a variety of paleoclimatic and paleoceanographic uh, conditions, such as uh, different upper water, water and deep water column processes or the, the input of terrestrial material and river runoff. Uh, and also we can learn a lot just from the, the physical characteristics of the sediment, their color, the mineralogy and the fossils that are there. Uh, as well as with, from their co-variation with Earth's orbital parameters that I will talk a bit about uh, later. Uh, and of course, all the, the, the marine sediments that I studied, uh, all the material that was available was uh, there, be was available because of the amazing work uh, that uh, three uh, projects have done and programs, uh, the DSTP, the ODP and the IODP. And uh, they have drilled around the world for the last more than 50 years, and they have recovered sediment cores that are the material that, that we study. Uh, and I, I focused in the beginning mainly in, in material from, from Northwestern Australia, but then I, I moved to other sites uh, across different ocean basins. 
Uh, going back to, to the phytoplankton, uh, my main focus and my main specialization, let's say, is in calcareous nanoplankton. And uh, these organisms live also today and they have uh, cosmopolitan species that uh, form beautiful blooms when they are really abundant that can be seen from space. And uh, they also have a very good preservational potential because they, they are uh, calcifying unicellular organisms that produce uh, plates from calcium carbonate that surround the cell. Uh, and therefore uh, they can be preserved. And uh, these are called calcareous nanofossils. And uh, the reason why we study them is uh, because they have a continuous record since the late Triassic. So if you're looking for, for records that are continuous in geology, this is uh, one of the best places to look, the, the plankton. Uh, and then they are also, in most of the times, uh, uh, they are abundant, and in many cases, they are highly abundant in the sediments, and they have uh, good preservation in, in many cases, and they have been used as paleoclimatic and paleoceanographic proxies, and they can give us many indications about different uh, conditions uh, in the ocean. Uh, another aspect of the, the phytoplankton that I focused on was biogenic sedimentation. So as I previously mentioned, the, the calcareous nanoplankton produces uh, carbonate, uh, the, the, the so-called coccoliths that surround the, the, cell, the cell. And there are many other phytoplanktonic and zooplanktonic organisms that, uh, that produce biogenic uh, minerals. And uh, and they, these can be uh, carbonate, uh, they can be chemical compounds, uh, they can be made, they can be carbonate or biogenic silica. And if they are carbonate, they mainly come from coccolithophores and calcareous nanoplankton practically and uh, foraminifera, whereas if they are, uh, we're talking about biogenic opal, uh, they are mainly diatoms and radiolaria that produce these biogenic sediments. And uh, in many cases, uh, we use the accumulation rates of these biogenic sediments um, to infer changes in the export production. So how much organic matter was reaching and sinking in the bottom of the ocean and was preserved in the sediments without being reminer remineralized. And uh, if we see uh, sustained changes in the accumulation rates of biogenic sediments, we can ultimately uh, infer changes in the upper water column processes. So how much phytoplankton uh, was there, uh, was living there. And therefore we call that paleoproductivity is the, the amount of organic matter uh, that was produced by phytoplankton back then. Uh, of course, it's never that easy as you know, with proxies uh, and uh, there are other parameters that are playing a role for the preservation of biogenic sediments uh, and for the amount of, uh, let's say the accumulation rates that we are recording. And some of those uh, are the CCD depth and uh, the dilution of the signal of biogenic sedimentation by, by terrigenous input, by terrigenous material and uh, the bottom currents and the, the chemistry of the bottom ocean that uh, might be diluting, uh, the dissolving uh, carbonate or biogenic uh, silica. Um, in terms of uh, the interval that I investigated, I, uh, I found very interesting to, to focus on uh, the period between the two red lines that you can see here, so seven and three million years ago. And uh, this is a period called uh, the late Miocene uh, to Pliocene. It's really interesting in, in, for many different reasons. It was a very tectonically active period with uh, the Panama closing and the, the, the Indonesian through flow restriction and the, the, the Bering Strait opening and, and many other, there are many, it was a really tectonically active period. And also in terms of climate, it was a, a period that although there was a, a global cooling going on, uh, it was characterized by, by higher 
sea surface temperatures than today and also CO2 levels that were similar to the ones we have today. And for this reason, many distinct intervals within this period have been previously used as uh, very good past analogs for, for future global warming. Um, there were many other changes that happened during that time in the marine and terrestrial biota. Um, but one of the, the um, intervals that I would like to, to, to focus uh, and that I, I focused during my research is the so-called uh, biogenic bloom. Um, and uh, in terms of phytoplankton, this is the most important and, and paleoproductivity, this was uh, the most important um, interval uh, during within the late Miocene and Pliocene. And it was a period of uh, higher biogenic sedimentation that, were, that was characterized by higher biogenic sedimentation in all major ocean basins. And uh, it has been interpreted uh, also as a, an overall increase in the abundance uh, of nutrients in the ocean. Um, or it has been also interpreted as, a, as an interval where we had, a, a, let's say, an increase in, in specific areas, for example, in upwelling areas in expense of, of other more oligotrophic areas of the ocean. But in any case, it was a period where, where higher biogenic sedimentation was observed in, in the Atlantic and Pacific and the Indian Ocean. And, um, and one of the main hypotheses actually for, for why this period occurred and why it has been interpreted as a period of uh, increased paleoproductivity involves uh, intensified nutrient supply in the ocean and involves the, the monsoonal intensification, which through uh, processes of uh, precipitation and river runoff brings more nutrients in the ocean. Uh, so I, I think this is also why this is so relevant to, to this monsoon seminar, and we will talk about this a bit more later. Um, another important, um, uh, let's say, concept that uh, I need to, to present before going into the results is Earth's orbital parameters. So the three main components of, uh, of uh, the Earth's, uh, uh, the three main movements of the Earth, so the eccentricity that, uh, that uh, dictates the, the shape uh, that uh, the rotation of the Earth around the Sun has and the, the change in the tilt of the axis of the Earth, that is the obliquity, and uh, the change in the direction, let's say, of the axis uh, of the Earth, that is the precession. And uh, you can see here the, an example of the evolution of these uh, orbital parameters in, in time and uh, in the time domain and the frequency domain. And as you can see, they have uh, the eccentricity has a 405 and 100,000 year periodicity and um, obliquity has a 41, a main component of 41,000 years periodicity and precession to uh, cycles of 23 and 19,000. Um, and of course, uh, it is uh, well established that these orbital parameters um, are playing an important role in controlling the, the irradiance that reaches Earth from the sun and uh, the, the distribution of light and also the intensity of light that reaches Earth's surface. And for this reason, they also play an important role in, uh, paleo, in major paleoclimatic and uh, paleoceanographic, uh, in paleoclimatic and paleoceanographic conditions, and in many major climatic systems. And one of those is uh, the monsoon. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail in, in what the monsoon is. I think there are people that are attending this lecture are probably specialists in that. And, and, uh, yeah, you, you are familiar with uh, the concept, but what I want to, to pinpoint is that uh, there is an effect uh, that the orbital cycles have in, on uh, monsoonal intensity. 
And for example, here you can see the effect that the, that the precessional cycle can have. And you can see that the precession uh, minima in this case uh, can lead to a stronger summer radiation than the, compared to the modern seasonal cycle and, uh, and a weaker winter radiation compared to the modern seasonal cycle. And that can lead to a stronger summer monsoon and, uh, uh, and the weaker winter radiation leads to a stronger winter monsoon compared to, to the modern. So there is an effect of the precession and, and how, how, how high the amplitude, let's say, of the, of the precessional cycle is in controlling the intensity of uh, the, monsoon, the monsoon. Uh, so I will present uh, the results from my research in two chapters. Uh, in chapter one, we will have uh, the initial study that I did during the first two years of my PhD, uh, in which I was investigating Calcareous nanofossil from the Northwestern Australian shelf. And uh, this is when I, where I developed the ideas that then went to be more, uh, to, to, to expand further. Uh, so this will be the more regional um, study, and then we will move into the a, a more global, let's say, or larger scale story. Uh, and uh, the figures that you will see in the results uh, uh, in this chapter are published in these two publications that you can see. And um, if it's not stated otherwise, also the, the figures come from, from these publications. Um, so I want to, to show the overall, the, the, the general overview of the area that uh, the studies was located. And this is the Indo-Pacific Worm Pole, is the, the warmest uh, area of the world in terms of uh, sea surface temperature. And um, uh, I specifically, I investigated uh, two drill sites, the ones that you can see with uh, green here, U1463 and U1464. And um, these sites uh, were drilled during Expedition 356, and this is where I got my material from, uh, the IODP, of course, uh, Expedition 356. And um, they are uh, very well located in the path of uh, the Indonesian through flow, uh, these two sites. And the Indonesian through flow is the major set of currents that brings uh, warm water from the Western Pacific warm pool, so from the Pacific into the Indian Ocean. And uh, one of the main currents in the area is also the Leo wind that uh, takes this warm water and, and transports it further uh, towards higher latitudes, uh, towards the, the higher latitudes in the south. And uh, the, the first uh, step for investigating, the, of course, the, there were many results that came out of this investigation, but I will focus a bit more on the, on the phytoplankton and why is this relevant to the biogenic bloom. And uh, but the first, just as an indication, the first uh, thing that we tried, uh, that we did uh, was uh, we wanted to have a good age model and astronomical control. So what we did is we, we made uh, astronomically tuned age models for IODP sites U1463 and U1464. Uh, and for do, to do that, uh, we used the, the potassium record. Uh, this is not. Uh, this is just an indication from from the from the summaries, uh, just to show the which record we use, and we also assess the lithostratigraphy and the basin depth, and uh, and uh, one important aspect of of this research was that we actually used the potassium weight percent record and the, the time series, the, the, the record that was uh, astronomically tuned and spanned from 6.1 to 4 million years uh, as a proxy for humid conditions and uh, river runoff. Um, and uh, in terms of uh, phytoplankton, which is the main focus for this presentation, I, I investigated the calcareous uh, nanofossil 
and I used the astronomically tuned age model to to generate um, time series for relative and absolute abundances of uh, the calcareous nanofossils uh, that I found in the sediment. And the main focus uh, was uh, given in the small bloom forming species of uh, reticulofenestra and Jephyrocapsa. And also other dominant species were investigated uh, such as Phenolithus. And uh, ultimately, apart from investigating the absolute and relative abundances, mm, I also generated a ratio of abundant species uh, that was then used uh, as a nanofossil index for stratification and water column mixing over the Northwestern Australian shelf. Um, moving into the results, uh, we identified three intervals of interest. Uh, and here you can see a graphic illustration of, of these results. So the potassium uh, weight percent record. Um, and then the, the nanofossil relative abundance of the most dominant species and what we got from the stratification index. And um, the two intervals of interest that are mostly interesting for uh, paleoproductivity and uh, for uh, the evolution of phytoplankton are uh, the one between 5.4 and 5.2. Uh, and during this interval, we observed a, a decrease in the stratification index, which we interpreted as an increase in seasonal water column mixing. Uh, so uh, less stratification and stronger seasonality in the area. And we interpreted this as a, a more regional signal since it co-varied with uh, also with uh, the patterns in sea surface temperatures in the area. Uh, whereas during the other interval of interest, which uh, was between 4.6 and 4.4 million years, uh, we observed a, a more significant change in the nanofossil assemblage, uh, which was uh, characterized by a shift in the dominant species from reticulofenestra into Jephyrocapsa, so we are in the small bloom forming uh, category. Um, and this was a major uh, overturn, let's say, but apart from that, uh, it was also followed by uh, a decrease in the nanofossil. It wasn't only a change in the relative abundance, it was also a, a shift, a, a, a stepwise decrease in the nanofossil accumulation rates of the dominant species so of reticulofenestra, and also a stepwise decrease in the total uh, uh, calcareous nanofossil accumulation rates. Uh, at the same time, this change was not translated into a significant change in the stratification index. Uh, so it couldn't be. Um, interpret it as a, as a regional signal. Uh, there was no major change in our humidity index in the potassium. And uh, therefore we started thinking that maybe this was reflecting a larger scale, larger scale process that had to do with uh, the nutrient budget in the Eastern Indian Ocean or even bigger than that. Uh, so then uh, having that in mind, uh, we, we left that there, let's say, and, and we had to go and look for other evidence for significant changes in, uh, in the phytoplankton abundances and in paleoproductivity during this time. And of course, we couldn't do that without focusing on the biogenic bloom, which, as I told you, was the major event that was happening uh, at that time. Um, and uh, the, the figures and the results that you will see here, uh, unless stated otherwise, uh, were published in, in the publication you, you can see here in the bottom. And uh, so the plan here was to, to see if the abrupt shift in dominant species, uh, so in the bloom forming species, uh, 
and the decrease in nanofossil abundance uh, and fluxes accumulation rates of nanofossils over the northwestern Australian shelf could be related to something bigger, to the biogenic bloom. Um, and at the same time, uh, we were generally interested in trying to figure out uh, when was the end of the biogenic bloom, uh, something that was hasn't been clarified um, and hasn't been investigated in, in depth. And if uh, actually the main question was if we could figure out if the end of the biogenic bloom was synchronous across basins. And of course, to try and go and uh, and um, investigate the main hypothesis uh, of why did it occur so that we can figure out maybe also why it ended. Um, and going back to our um, to the map of all the the drilling programs throughout the years, our goal was to to figure out to find uh, records that could help us that were covering the the interval of interest and uh, that were high resolution enough uh, so that we can investigate the, the biogenic bloom. And uh, we started looking for, for records of uh, uh, biogenic sedimentation uh, and for, for records of um, accumulation rate of uh, biogenic sediment of carbonate and opal and also nanofossils, which can also be used. So the, the accumulation rates of uh, nanofossils can also be used uh, as indicators of paleoproductivity, especially if we see sustained changes in, in the accumulation rates without any other obvious reason of why this occurred in terms of uh, dissolution and preservation. Um, so uh, what we wanted to do was, as I said, try to find uh, the more the better, the, all the records we could find. And uh, and actually, we wanted to we we made a, a scoring system that was uh, keeping the records that were, were higher resolution and uh, the ones that uh, also had a good sample spacing and uh, were leaving out the ones that were low resolution that they, they wouldn't be able to to see changes that occurred within 100 or 200,000 years. So between 4.6 and 4.4, for example, that we saw in over Northwestern Australia. Uh, and after uh, checking the, the records, uh, we ended up with the ones that you see with uh, blue, so the, the field circles. And as you can see, our compilation is uh, biased towards uh, low latitudes. Most of the records were situated between uh, 30 north and 30 south. Um, and uh, they do represent uh, all major basins. And uh, the compilation was done by standardizing the records of biogenic sedimentation. So the accumulation rates of carbonate and opal and nanofossils, and then uh, calculating uh, medians between uh, the records so that we end up with a compiled record for each major ocean basin. And then in the end for a compilation of uh, the low latitudes since most records come from there. And uh, the result um, looked something like that. So as you can see, there is a, a variation, significant variation and differences between the compiled records of paleoproductivity in the Atlantic and Pacific and Indian Ocean. Uh, but what we can uh, see is that between 4.6 and, and 4.4 million years, uh, all records uh, show uh, a, a distinct uh, step-wise decrease in, in paleoproductivity. And if put all together, uh, so we have the low latitude uh, combination, uh, compilation here in panel D, this becomes even more obvious. And you can see that between 4.6 and 4.4 million years in a similar way as the one we saw with uh, the, the nanofossils, the, the change in the dominance of species and the decrease in, in accumulation rates of nanofossils over Northwestern Australia, we have a 
sustained decrease in power productivity that somehow yeah it, it's it, it is sustained and and um after that was already a, a very important observation and when we keep high resolution records we observe this stepwise change uh, but of course we wanted to go a step further and try to understand why did this occur and link it to maybe some of the hypotheses that are out there for for why the biogenic bloom occurred um, and uh, of course, one of the, the main uh, aspects that we had to look at was the orbital configuration at that time. And uh, from our observations, it was clear that uh, during the 4.6 and to 4.4 million year uh, step, uh, there was a, a reduction, a, a constant reduction in the eccentricity. And actually, it was during an eccentricity node, which is a, a special, let's say, eccentricity cycle that uh, occurs of, uh, approximately every 2.4 million years and has a lower amplitude. And uh, it was a, a continuous, it, it therefore means that, that we have a continuous decrease in eccentricity for 200,000 years. And at the same time, we had a shift from high amplitude obliquity into low amplitude obliquity. And uh, these things, th this uh, orbital configuration um, means that the number of uh, days that we had irradiance that was higher than 350 uh, watts per square meter was constantly, let's say, decreasing for 200,000 years and, and the seasonality was decreasing for 200,000 years. Um, and, uh, of course, uh, here we, we, we have the correlation with this orbital configuration, but, uh, we need also a physical mechanism of why would this orbital configuration would lead to something that could decrease palo productivity in such a, a way. Um, and, uh, we we had to to look into one of the main hypotheses that are out there for the for why the biogenic bloom occurred in the first place uh, so therefore the system of the monsoonal intensity and uh, the river runoff that uh, increased pre precipitation extremes during monsoonal extremes um, can have and uh, of course, we can imagine that when we have a reduction in seasonality, uh, this could have influenced the monsoonal ex extremes. And uh, why this is relevant can be also seen here from a map of all the major rivers that belong to the global top 30 based on river discharge. So the, the rivers that are influenced by the monsoonal system are uh, bringing a vast amount of nutrients into the ocean. Uh, and therefore we started looking for some evidence and we presented in this paper some evidence of, um, of uh, a, a, a weakening of the monsoon during uh, the time interval between 4.6 and 4.4 million years. Uh, and this evidence comes from the chemical weathering intensity, so from the rubidium strontium ratio and the uh, chemical index of alteration from South China Sea, which uh, records the intensity of the monsoon and arguably uh, uh, river runoff in the area. Um, so we did, we were able to, to match some evidence uh, for. Uh, monsoonal intensity with our uh, sustained change in palo productivity and this orbital configuration that gives us an explanation of how this mechanism would work and to to provide with an ever overview of the mechanism in case i was a bit confusing uh, which it might be the case so having a combination of a long-term reduction in eccentricity amplitude uh, especially during an eccentricity node where we don't see a high interchange between high and uh, low 
eccentricity, but we see a constant decrease uh, in eccentricity. Uh, and the shift in towards lower amplitude obliquity, these orbital uh, parameters combined together are having an effect of uh, reduced seasonality uh, for, for continuous reduction in seasonality for 200,000 years. And uh, therefore, we had less and less uh, the lack of monsoonal extremes in low latitudes. And this could have led to the reduced uh, runoff and nutrient supply in the ocean. And uh, we currently have uh, some evidence from the East Asian monsoon, so the, the area that uh, where the rivers end in, in the South China Sea. And uh, this could have led to, to, uh, to conditions in the ocean uh, where the biogenic bloom was actually that couldn't was not able the nutrient supply to sustain the biogenic bloom so we had the abrupt productivity decrease and somehow the collapse in low latitudes of uh, productivity uh but of course the story is uh, sorry the story is never that simple and i just want to show here how many more uh proxies and how many more uh how much more evidence there is out there uh and and makes the story of course more complex uh but still uh, it was interesting for me that's why i included this figure from cliff et al in 2022 that really nicely compiled different records from the east asian monsoon and south china sea and uh, if we see here in the shaded area between seven and three million years, we have the late Miocene to Pliocene. Uh, and uh, between, uh, uh, we, we have the, the, the period between seven and the reduction of, uh, of uh, the, the decrease in paleoproductivity. Uh, so we can see here that in, in this shaded area between 4.6 and 4.4 million years, uh, we are within um, a, a low, arguably the lowest phase in terms of uh, weathering in South China Sea uh, for the last at least 10 million years. And uh, we have something similar happening with the evidence from the NGR, from drill holes, uh, so the erosion, and, and we are in a low uh, in the seasonality uh, recorded by the hematite getite uh, at South, South China Sea. And we also see that we have a very low humidity and magnetic susceptibility from, from central China. So somehow this combined um, is something that I, I tried to not be biased and check, of course, other intervals, but uh, it seems that there was a combination of a, a period of low seasonality, less humid, uh, less intense Asia, East Asian monsoon, and uh, less uh, weathering that could have led to a collapse of productivity in low latitudes and, and therefore uh, to the end of the biogenic bloom in low latitudes. Um, of course, there needs to be much more research in that, and it's not that simple, even in terms of uh, records of paleoproductivity and biogenic sedimentation. Uh, so, uh, as you can see, uh, as we already saw when we were publishing this paper, another paper came out showing that uh, a, a high resolution astronomically tuned age model a uh, record of uh, calcium carbonate accumulation rates from ODP 1264 uh, in the southern in South uh, um, Atlantic Ocean um, was published, and they actually suggested that the termination of the biogenic bloom, uh, inferring uh, the changes from the calcium carbonate accumulation rates occurred at 3.3 million years, which is more than a million year after what we are suggesting. But of course, I would argue that if we visually inspect the record, this is the blue curve here, the, the abrupt decrease seems to happen somewhere around 4.4 million years, if you ask me. But still, this is 300, 400,000 years 
uh, after what we observed in in the orange compilation here of palo productivity in low latitudes that you can see. So there, there still needs uh, a lot needs to be done. I just want to to collect here all the observations that I made during my PhD. So between 4.6 and 4.4 million years, uh, we had the before state, which was characterized by more uh, river runoff in the South China Sea and more river, uh, let's say monsoonal intensity mm -hmm. and uh, dominance of uh, a small reticular fenestra over Northwestern Australian shelf and higher palo productivity. And then moving to towards 4.4, we had the, the decreased uh, extreme, the less extremes, uh, monsoon, East Asian monsoon extremes, uh, less river runoff and uh, a decrease in palo productivity in low latitudes and uh, a shift from the small reticular fenestra into small Jephyrocapsa and a decrease in nanofossil abundances over Northwestern Australia. And that was controlled by uh, a decrease in eccentricity and a shift uh, in, ampl in low amplitude obliquity. Uh, so for the future, uh, I have many ideas and uh, I think that uh, what needs to be done is we need more compilation records, if possible, also compilation records of high resolution, compilation of high resolution records from monsoonal proxies. That would be really helpful to do a one-on-one -on -one, uh, correlation if the H models are high resolution with uh, the ones we get in, in the, uh, from the sediment. So matching somehow terrestrial processes and, and processes of uh, river runoff and precipitation and humidity on land with the palo productivity and see if we have something there, if, if we can really do that for such important intervals such as the biogenic bloom. And also I am interested in seeing what this end of the biogenic bloom in low latitudes, at least as we suggested, meant for the for phytoplankton evolution in other areas. We, we saw that we had that it had a big impact over Northwestern Australia shelf. I would like to investigate other sites. Uh, the higher latitudes were really underrepresented in our study. Uh, so there is evidence that there was actually a shift in biogenic uh, depot centers. So a shift in, in, in depot centers and an increase at that time of biogenic sedimentation towards higher latitudes. And these need to be investigated be better and included in integrated in our interpretation of if actually the biogenic bloom ends as we know it or or changes form in a sense uh and the of course it's really important to understand the effect of orbital cycles and how these control the processes the monsoonal and the the processes uh, in the ocean that can lead to sustained changes and what kind of orbital configuration uh can end such uh, intervals of in increased biogenic sedimentation in the ocean. Uh, so thank you very much for your attention. I would like to thank Uppsala University for, for being my, my, the university that gave me an opportunity to do my PhD uh, and for all these amazing years in Sweden and uh, the Swedish Research Council for funding my research and of course the IODP which provides this amazing material and i hope it it continues providing this amazing material that we can study uh, so if you have questions or just want to talk science you can contact me and thank you again for your attention thank you boris very interesting so um are there does anyone wish to ask some questions I don't see anything in the chat at the moment. Um, I, I was going to ask you what you felt like the influence of the Indonesian through flow was in compared to like the Asian monsoon, that what influence do we see on the Northwest Australian shelf that might be different from what you see in other parts of Eastern Asia? Uh, yeah, so... It doesn't seem that it always uh, uh, 
coupled, to be fair, the records between the the monsoonal records and the ones in over Australia. Uh, so it seems that the the through flow itself is is mostly dictating the climate at least during this period right we're talking late miocene early pliocene is dictating the climatic vari variability yeah, over northwestern like australia seems it, like a critical interval when the when the through flow is changing in strength significantly yeah it, it seems to me that as the, the continent moves northwards and progressively enters uh, and we'll have the constriction also of the Indonesian through flow. The influence of this monsoonal system, also the Australian monsoon becomes more intense. Wow. But at that time, back in the late Miocene, early Pliocene is more of a, also the potassium record that we had a more uh, constant humid period, let's say more than a, a very seasonal monsoon controlled uh, period, I would say. Do you know if this wet period is affecting Eastern Australia as well as the Northwest Shelf? Or do we, that's not known yet? I think it's not in the same way, at least. It was observed and uh, there is also some contradiction. Uh, if I remember correctly, the records from other places in Australia are actually not recording such intense humid conditions as the northwestern part uh, at that time. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> cool. Thank you. So Thank you. Uh, there's a question from Jerry Dickens here. Jerry, do you want to ask your oh. question yourself? Hey, hey, Boris, uh, thank you for the talk there. Uh, so I, might, I asked the question, I'm not sure if you saw it in the chat. Um, one thing that's always bothered me with the interpretation of adding nutrients to drive the biogenic bloom is if we go back and look at records from even DSDP days in the equatorial Pacific, if you get off the equator, the carbonate accumulation drops. And then on the equator, the carbonate accumulation increases. And so what you see, and, and Mitch Lyle redid all the work, including the ODP legs, and he sees the same effect, uh, you know, with new age models and everything else. And so it's, it's like the pro productivity in the region itself stays the same, but it becomes more intensified under the equator and less intense away from the equator. And I'm wondering how that observation fits in with your your uh, your work and, and whether the timing's uh, the same uh, if you look at all the sites, including those off the equator. So yeah, uh, we 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 have touched on the matter, I think, also <laughs> in the past. So uh, I I didn't uh, choose any records based on if they are close to the equator or. Uh, or let's say my criteria was only based on, on resolution of age models, right? And then mm -hmm. there are records that are actually not considered at all upwelling region records that uh, I would say had this signal. And in terms of overall, uh, of uh, let's say overall um, accumulation rates, uh, they might be, of course, they are lower. If they are in oligotrophic region, we have lower accumulation rates. But for me, the important was, that's why I standardize the records also, if we have a, a decrease, no matter if, we, if we're going from low to just a bit lower, it's still the same signal as going from very high to low. So I was just looking for relative changes. And uh, as moving towards higher latitudes, indeed, we were seeing the opposite, what you say. But this was more of a latitudinal effect, uh, the way I saw it from my compilation, rather a, a, a eutrophic versus oligotrophic area effect. It was more of a, uh, let's say, plus 30, minus 30, uh, um, how do you say, um, latitude uh, or not. Uh, or higher latitude, uh, 
rather than a, a, an oligotroph because nor the northwestern Australia itself it's not a, a, a huge upwelling area or something it's right. not a very strong effect there and uh, the nanofossil it's where it all started is where I saw the most strong yeah. signal yeah I think uh, those records are are interesting I, I guess I guess and I don't want to take too much time here because other people may have questions but it's it's awkward because, and it's always been a problem, if we go off the equator to, if we go to an area of, let's say, low sedimentation rate, and if the answer to the biogenic bloom is low sedimentation rate areas become even less, you know, there's even lower sedimentation, but we avoid those areas because we can't get high resolution records. And then exactly, when we yeah. the compilation, it's, we've already bought the whole answer. <laughs> It, exactly, it's a loop. But arguably also, if I can move to... So I, I don't think also 1264 is, is much of a very eutrophic uh, area or, or something. It's considered as a South Atlantic, relatively low sedimentation rate and, and carbonate accumulation rate record. And uh, it still records at a similar time the the signal i am recording with my compilation and i think that even the fluctuations are really similar actually um and here there is indeed an offset of 300,000 years but I, I will i will be really interested to look actually i have some i have looked up a bit at the age models trying to figure out if maybe it's a discrepancy of age models but uh, yeah, this one, this record, for example, is some evidence from not such a as from an upwelling area. Uh, the northwestern Australian shelf, I would argue, and then there were some other. I don't remember exactly the site numbers that are in the Indian Ocean, not towards the Arabian Sea or in the more upwelling areas, but more in the the middle that had a similar signal. But the ones that really don't have it for sure are the North Pacific. And this is why in the paper, we actually talked about a shift in depot centers. And uh, there we really see a, a, like a switch. It's like the Northern than, than California, let's say, and towards the North Pacific, uh, we see an increase in the accumulation rates. And, and this is a whole different story and mechanism. Mm -hmm. uh, there might be that well, there was a, more a bigger change of course that uh, is linked to as we wrote in the paper uh, to the closing of the panama and the strengthening of the uh, the amok etc and the north atlantic deep water formation and etc but in terms of just the effect of uh, of river runoff and nutrient supply in low latitude, which arguably is a direct effect because this is where <laughs> the nutrients end up. I think it's an interesting hypothesis that we have here because it's also pretty fast. We really see a stepwise decrease in within 200,000 years. And, and I always feel uncomfortable when we are talking about tectonic processes that just started abruptly 200,000 years later it, it was all over it started like that high accumulation rates or something then 200,000 years later low like this is a pretty abrupt shift in in yeah paleoceanographic time scales of course but yeah <laughs> oh thanks thank you thank you uh, we have another question from Alana uh, Azevedo do Alana do you want to ask your question Hi, can you hear me? Yes. 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 Oh, okay. Uh, as I put you here in the chat, uh, I would like to thank you uh, for the amazing talk. And also, I would like to know if you think the, the Southern Africa monsoon uh, can be a potential provider of nutrients to your study site because uh, we observe in our records from IODP that. Uh, the this musonal uh, this musonal system is bringing nutrients to our our study sites. So and our records are also um, sensitive to the late Miocene biogenic bloom. So I would like to to know your opinion about it. 
Yes, thank you for the question. Uh, you said the South American, uh, uh, was I right? South American monsoon? South, or and, South and African monsoon. African. African, yeah. Okay, South okay. Africa. just to, yeah. to, to put it yeah, in my mind where we are. Yeah, I, I think, as I said, the only, the main story in this paper we published was the, the way we compiled records and the observation that there was a decrease in accumulation rates uh, that was interpreted as a decrease in pilot productivity. After that, we have really, uh, we, we made the hypothesis and we had limited evidence from, from the East Asian monsoon that we collected and from South China. So uh, starting from that, it's really interesting for me to see all kinds of records because we, we just hypothesized that this is the main system that is playing a role. But mm -hmm. if we are decreasing the eccentricity and theoretically the monsoonal system might be uh, weakening overall, I would be really interested to hear from all Indian monsoon and, uh, but we need this kind of resolution, right? We need to be able to compare things, not having like really large scale and low resolution records mm -hmm. because then it becomes tricky to, to pinpoint where the abrupt change happened. So I would like to see everything from African monsoon to South American to, to Indian and Asian and, in, and uh, Arabian and East Asian, everything I think, having records from all areas would be the best way to go with it. Because if we're talking an overall change in low latitude uh, in the nutrient budget, we should look at all major riverine systems and, and therefore at precipitation patterns over all continents and therefore all monsoonal systems and their response to this orbital configuration. So I think it's really interesting what you're doing. We can exchange some emails maybe <laughs> uh, that's great that's great uh, I, I will email you until um, the end of this week is it is it okay for you yeah of course no whatever you want <laughs> <laughs> thank you that's great so um very good so i don't see any other questions so Unless somebody wants to speak up, I think we should thank Boris for his presentation. Um, and uh, you can either do that physically or with your emojis. And then please, uh, I want to remind you next week, we have um, uh, we have a new talk from uh, Or Bialik from the University of Haifa. And Or's going to talk to us about the Indian Ocean Miocene and productivity records there. So please come back if you can next week. Livio Josan will be your host. But uh, in the meantime, stay safe, have fun with science, and I'll see you all soon. Thank you.